it out that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Energy Week with George Harvey and Tom Fennell. This is Tom Fennell. Amazing. <laughs> I'm George Harvey, which I think is possibly less amazing, but nevertheless it's true. Um, <clears throat> every day I go off and spend uh, hideous amounts of time looking at the news, usually about three hours a day. And I go through hundreds of articles finding the ones that I've think are interesting about climate change, global warming, and things. Look at my hair standing up. It's ridiculous. And um, you're adjusting your hair? I'm adjusting. Well, <laughs> not, not right now, but I just did. <laughs> Everybody can see it, so why not worry about it? <laughs> OK. Every day, I go through a couple of hours looking at the news. And, and uh, climate change, global warming, energy, renewable power, nuclear power, all sorts of things. And I find the articles that I think are the, are the most interesting. Post them on my blog, which is geoharvey.wordpress.com. Um, learn a lot of stuff, which winds up, a lot of it, being in Green Energy Times. Um, you're very useful. It's, it's work that is very useful for me. But I share it with people. And every week, uh, Tom and I get together and go through a collection of about the last week's 20 most interesting items. The best of the blog. The best of the blog. That's right. <laughs> Man, um, if we had said such a thing in the 1930s, they would have thought that we were <laughs> dysfunctional. <laughs> okay, starting with last Thursday, which is the 22nd of January, we have this. A project called Second Life Batteries is bringing Bosch, the BMW Group, and Vattenfall together. Vattenfall is Swedish. I don't know how to pronounce it in Swedish. <laughs> I'm Two. sure the V is not a, not a V. It might be, though. You know. <clears throat> I think it's a W. Wattenfall. Yeah. Well, well, I don't that's know. Interesting. What do I I can, we could ask Ralph Maima, see what he says. He is knows. he Swedish? I believe he is, yeah. but he certainly yeah. speaks Swedish. Oh, does he? Yeah. yeah. Um, together with, uh, to interconnect used batteries from electric vehicles to form a large scale energy storage system in Hamburg as part of the virtual this is, plant, this is this is large this is big <laughs> it's energy is available within seconds to help keep power the, the power grid stable this is from autocar professional you know Tom I did a little co computation it's kind of based on the idea that five years from now we're gonna have uh, about a million electric cars coming out on the road every year Okay, GM in is five years, huh? in five years. That's, GM is I, going I think heavily. That's believable. Yeah. yeah, Ford is going heavily. They're really moving into electric cars for a bunch of different reasons. But the thing that's interesting is that means five years after that, which would be about 20, uh, 24. There's going to be a lot of batteries. There's going to be a <laughs> lot of used batteries, and those batteries have got about two thirds of their life left ahead of them. Well, if it I understand it correctly, they're no longer useful to, to for, for the for the usage in a car. Right. But they still got plenty of life left. That's right. <laughs> so they're going to be good for ten years or more, possibly on the grid. And I I did a little calculation based on the idea that um, these batteries would be about a hundred kilowatt hours, which is more than a current Tesla battery. But it, you know, five years from now, that might be normal. And came to the conclusion that we would be putting enough ba enough battery power, we could be putting enough battery power on the grid every year to back up the entire country by about 15 minutes. So we'd be putting... We could back up the entire country for, for 15, 15 minutes? minutes? Using one year's batteries. Yeah, that's that's, that's, that's scrap, amazing. That's scrap batteries. <laughs> <laughs> that's recycling. That is recycling. Yeah, wow. But if you think about that, we're talking about hours of storage by 2050. We're talking about hours of storage, and it's just going to get bigger because the battery technology is just going to get better. It's getting better. Yep. So people ask, how can we build all those batteries? Uh, we're building them already. <laughs> we're building them already. We're going to have 
uh, you know, batteries up the wazoo, as they say. People will be building houses out of batteries. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. The new cinder blocks. What do you have there? <laughs> this the this is what uh, what a, a schematic of what they're doing here. Ah, okay. They're recycling the batteries from the cars. Yes. And they're refabricating them and putting them in different boxes and stuff like that. Right. I'm sure they're cleaning them up. Yeah. And then they're in a reuse situation. They're right. putting a whole bunch of these things together in a building and hooking it up to the grid and uh, yep. voila. Yep. I mean, this, it's, is, this, this isn't rocket science. No, it's not. And, and you know, the Germans have been using, have been doing reuse uh, programs for a long time. If you buy a, a Mercedes, yeah, and people in this country think of Mercedes as being a nice car. It is. It's a nice <laughs> car. But you buy a Mercedes, and there will be used parts in it. Oh yeah. 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 They they don't let those parts go to waste. So anyway, we should keep going. The next item comes from Gulf Business News. Dubai has more than doubled its target for renewables in its overall energy mix given the falling cost of solar power. The change comes days after the Emirate upsized a planned solar array after receiving what the consortium building its scheme said was the cheapest cost ever proposed to generate solar power. Say and that again. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this, this, this. Five years ago, no one would have imagined that. No one would have imagined. I saw an interview after after this article, a day after this article came out, of uh, an energy consultant who was who was there and who was able. He I interviewed the head of the company that put in the, the winning bid on this. Okay. It was five point nine eight cents per kilowatt hour. Okay. Which is cheap. I mean, this is cheap power. 5.98 cents for solar power. Well, in Dubai, they've been making the power from oil. Yeah. And, the, and, and they, they don't want us, they want it, they'd rather sell the oil. That's right. <laughs> and, and, but the price of natural gas in Dubai, which is the natural gas being the next best competitor, yep. the price of natural gas was 9 cents per kilowatt hour. So they're, they're going down to about two thirds of the price yeah, of the cheapest yeah. competitor. And he said, he interviewed this guy because there had been a lot of talk about the idea that the solar power was somehow being subsidized. And um, the, the head of the company said that the, there was no subsidy, sub, subsidy. He, and he went through the numbers and showed how this was going to work. Uh -huh. Makes sense to me. It, it, it's really remarkable. <clears throat> and, uh, Dubai is in no way short of solar power. Probably not. <laughs> yeah. There's probably three cloudy days a year there. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's more than that because I lived in Saudi in, in March and April. It was wet and cloudy. Well, yeah. And, and the, desert, the, rest of the, the desert would turn green. Huh? The desert would yeah, turn yeah. green. And then a few days later, it would and all, no longer all be green. And all the Saudis who would go out camping in the desert, re re reliving the stories their grandfathers told them. <laughs> Isn't that great? Yeah. Okay, next item, renewable energy focus. The, it says the USDAOE announced an incentive program for developers adding hydroelectric power generating capacity to existing non-powered dams throughout the, throughout the United States. According to the DOE, equipping non-powered dams with generating capabilities could provide up to 12 gigawatts. This is resources sitting there that are not being used. This is the equivalent of 12 medium-sized nuclear power plants. Well, it is. Not in and, use. And these, these dams are all up and down here, all up and down both sides of the Connecticut River. And we don't have, the people who own them don't have to have uh, permits to put them in because they're already in. The dams are there. The dams are there. Yeah, so it's just a matter of putting a turbine in a penstock or something like that. Right. And, and, and that, that, that is what's being done. That, the picture that, there is one of them. It's Townsend Dam in uh, Townsend. Okay. It is not an insignificant problem to put a turbine in a penstock because you've got to have this thing hooked up to the grid. I talked to somebody yesterday who had one of these, and the, the dam was there, the turbine was there, mm. but, the, but it had been disconnected because it was not up to standards that the utility was requiring. Okay. Okay. So there's a lot of work that has to go on with this. Oh, yeah. One of the things that she was telling me was that, um, you know, people experimentally can do this kind of thing just to learn how it's done. And you can take, for example, an auto uh, water pump 
yeah. and and, a, and an alternator. Yeah. And put them together, and she said, Google um, pumped a generator, and uh, I'm sorry, uh, pumped a turbine, and um, alternator to generator, and you'll find instructions on how to do this, where on a, you know, experimental basis, so you can see how it works. You can, you can put these things together, a used yeah. auto uh, water pump and a used alternator, and you can hook it up with something and make power out of it. Well, we talked about that last week in Cuba. <laughs> they were doing exactly that. That's right. That. That's what they were doing. Yeah, <laughs> We weren't in Cuba. Or maybe you were in Cuba. I have been in Cuba. I wasn't, I wasn't there last week. No. You sinful <laughs> man. Okay. Next thing. Um, well, I just want to take a quick look at uh, Townsend Dam. Oh, the Townsend Dam, of course. Yeah, that's, uh, you can see the beach, you can see the dam, you can see the Connecticut, the West River. Yes. Route 30. Yes. And uh, the De Felice compound on the left and the bottom there. Yeah. The family has uh, about five houses there where all the family... You know, I was actually going to buy a house in New Jersey once, uh -huh. which was at a mill. The uh -huh. house was in an old mill. Okay. And it was a beautiful house. The, the, the living part of the house was fairly modern and had big picture windows that looked out over a pond. And what was happening was water was being diverted from a river into the pond. There was no dam in the river. It's just the it flow just, of the river yeah, was pushing. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. had it set up so it was pushing... Um, water down a little a little um, like a uh, sluice or something it was like a sluice but it looked yeah. like a, if you'd come across it walking through the woods you would have thought it was a stream yeah and it went into a pond and there were ducks and geese nesting out there and you could you could see, w look at the pond from the living room and you know it was, it was very beautiful it had a little beach and uh, the guy who lived there was an engineer and he told me <coughs> he took me out to the to the to the sluiceway where the where the water was just spilling out of this, and he had calculated the amount of water. As an engineer, you know this is something that this is what engineers do when they're retired. Yeah, <laughs> tell me about it. Yeah. <laughs> he had calculated the amount of water that was going down, the drop, the whole yeah, thing, yeah. and had come to the conclusion that it was about 13 horsepower. Okay. And 13 horsepower, if he had hooked that hooked up a turbine there would have provided his house with 100% of the energy that it needed and then mm -hmm. some. Mm -hmm. He could have heated the place with mm -hmm. electric power. Mm -hmm. You know, free. Yeah. There it is. <laughs> so anyway, um, we should go on, I suppose. Let us go on. Friday, January 23rd, <clears throat> Vermont is considering legislation changing, changing its energy policy. It would end the practice. Critics, critics say double counts benefits of renewable power sources. It would also allow utilities to count for credit weatherization and efficiency pro projects they sponsor, such as new windows, insulation, biomass heat, and heat pumps. This is from the San Francisco Chronicle. And... Um, Tom, you tell me that the link there doesn't work, but if you Google No, the link, it, the link worked, but they wanted money. Oh, they wanted money. <laughs> I don't know why it is they want money. Maybe it's because I look at it and it's fresh, and then later they want money. But <clears throat> nevertheless, if you Google well, these I, things, I got you can a, find it. I got the same article from the, uh, what the, what the heck, I forgot the town already. Um, I got it from a Vermont newspaper. Right, right. This is an interesting picture. It's kind of a pretty picture. Yep. I think it's still because there's a ski mountain in the background. Yes. But it's a downtown. It's not It's not new construction. This is an old town. That looks like the, um, the uh, uh, it looks like the, the streetlights in um, Montpelier. Well, there's no, there's no uh, ski, ski mountain in Montpelier. Well, obviously, they've moved <laughs> Montpelier to a ski mountain. <laughs> and there's uh, solar <laughs> panels on the streetlights. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a neat neat picture. I don't know where it is. If somebody knows, maybe well, they can uh, send us We had us an, an article about those streetlights in Green Energy Times. Oh, did you? I have forgotten where it was. Obviously. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, the Caledonian New Chronicle or something gave me. Yeah, Caledonia yeah. Record. Caledonian Record or something like yeah. that. That's, yeah. I know Caledonia hit it. Right. Um, the the. Um, this particular, the new, the new law that they're working on to get it through is basically saying this is what um, utilities should do. Mm -hmm. 
and then they're outlying in the law what Green Mountain Power is doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. kind of funny, but there and, you go. And in these deals, these deals here, the customers pay off the cost of the renewables yeah. in their electric bill. Right. And they're paying a power company, and the power company is paying off and, the loan. And typically what happens here, <clears throat> I've interviewed people who, uh, for Green Energy Times, interviewed people who have been through the process. And typically what happens is Green Mountain Power will come in, and they will say, you need, you need triple pane windows here. You need yeah. insulation in this yeah. wall. You need, and you go through this thing. They, they provided people with heat pumps. They provided solar panels for the roof. Mm -hmm. I, I, they provided. They arranged, they arranged for, for them. Yes. Insulation, windows, air sealing, um, energy audits, the whole thing. They had the whole thing done, and then the cost of this, the cost of the finance, is it goes to the Built customers in. paying for it, yeah. but it, it goes on the on the energy bill that they had been getting from Green Mountain Power. The bill is still coming from Green Mountain Power. It is bigger than the old bill, mm -hmm. but when you, when you take into account that there is no heating component, mm -hmm. all of a sudden you realize that every month they're saving money. You're paying more for your power and you're paying less for your gas. That's right. Or oil or whatever that's it is right. you're using. Oh, that's wood. right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And heat pumps are... Oh, that reminds me. We, should, we have to talk about this thing at some point. Oh, okay. Um, because it compares the cost of heat pumps with the cost of wood and the cost oh, of... Oh, okay. That's an interesting thing. It's an yeah. interesting thing. Yeah. We could stop any time and, and talk well, about that. Well, let's talk about it now. There's oh, you no, want to? No time to the okay. present. I got this thing from Tarm Biomass, which is in Lyme, New Hampshire. Right. Kind I'm going to put you up. Yeah, I want to hold that up. I hope... Yeah. Can, can, can people see that? I you got to aim it at the camera. <laughs> it's hard to get these things level because right is left and left is right. But that's what it is. It comes from Tarn Biomass, which is in Lyme, New Hampshire. And it has on the back um, what, the, what the various uh, assumptions are, the number of uh, BTUs in a unit of something, natural gas. The unit for natural gas is 1,000 cubic feet. And there are... Um, uh, a little over a million BTUs in a thousand cubic feet, and then they apply a boiler efficiency of 85% to that and come up with the net BTUs per unit. And then what this is, it's a, it's a dial. You can, if I peel this back, you can probably see that there's a yeah, window there. Yeah, yeah. And inside the window are, are columns with the headings at the top that say the number of BTUs, the cost of, of, a, the cost of a million BTUs. So and it's kind of a circular slide rule. Sort of. And so if you look at this thing and you see, I dialed it in here to a cost of $44 per million BTUs. This is the equivalent of 15 cents per kilowatt hour of electricity. But because we've got all these things all figured out right there, you can see that it is also the equivalent of $3.48 per gallon of propane. Okay. It's the equivalent of $5.24 per gallon of number two fuel oil. That's expensive. It is. This is 15 cents. So I can look at this thing and I can say, if I'm paying 15 cents per kilowatt hour for electricity and I compare it to my propane, because I'm using propane as well, if I am paying more than 348 for the propane, then, then you're if there's again. an option to <laughs> use electricity instead, yeah. I can go with the electricity. Yeah. And that means that, you know, when my propane bill last year went to 5.25 a gallon, yeah, it was, which it was did, it? Yeah. Um, because I was using very little and they were, they were charging extra because <laughs> I was using very little. Um, it was cheaper for me at 5.25 a gallon to, to um, run, a space heater. run space heaters, yeah. resistant space heaters. And I can dial this thing over to 5.22 a gallon. There's nothing that's 5.25 exactly. But 5.22 a gallon is the equivalent of 23, uh, 23 cents per kilowatt hour for electricity. Okay. Now, one thing that I would su suggest to people is if they get one of these calculators. And Where do they, they get them? I, I will explain that. Huh. Um, if they get one of these calculators um, and they want to think about heat pumps, there's, the electricity on here is resistance electricity. Yeah. You get about three times as much heat from a heat pump as you do from an electric uh, resistance heater. Per kilowatt hour. So if you're spending 15 cents per kilowatt hour on electricity, 
and you have heat pumps, that's the equivalent of about five cents per kilowatt hour for electricity okay. on the heat pump. And that um, <clears throat> is the equivalent of $1.90 a gallon for oil. Been a long time since we've done uh -huh. that. <laughs> $1.26 a gallon for propane. Wood pellets at $223 a ton. Uh, natural gas at $13.97 per thousand cubic feet. Firewood at $256 a cord. And, you know, so this is, a, this is a handy little thing that if you're interested in finding out what, which of a couple of different sources you could use for your, for your, for your mm -hmm. heat, this comes from Tarm Biomass. Who? Tarm, T-A-R-M. Tarm, uh -huh. T-A-R-M. And, uh, and it is in Lyme, New Hampshire, and I called them. The, the phone number is 800-782-9927. I called them and said, you guys still have these things? And the guy said, yes. So, you know, if somebody wants one, call up, and I guess they send it out. He, he said, yes, do you want one? And I said, I've already got one. <laughs> but I'm going to talk about them on a Yeah, that's show. cool. That's very Isn't cool. That fun? Yep. Okay. Moving now, right along. Moving right along. Yeah, we've lost a little time there. We'll pick um, up. Yeah. Utility Dive sent us this. Why electricities? This is, an, you, 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 this is a, an opinion piece. Why utilities across the nation are embracing solar power? Community, Community solar, solar, power. solar power. The shared renewables movement is catching on, and in 2015 could be the community solar's year. Ultimate uh, utilities and private sector players are immersed in plans. Regulators from California to the District of Columbia are working on program designs. Well, why would you want community solar instead of having a solar panel on your roof? Well, not everybody can have a solar panel uh -huh. on the roof. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> so you're a tenant? If you're a tenant, or maybe you're on the south side of the hill and you get your your sh you're shaded by the hill. Or maybe or, you live in a mine. Or maybe you live in a mine <laughs> <laughs> underground. Right. So if for any reason it's not feasible to put solar, yeah, on exactly. your house, you still have an option. There, yes, Join together and, with a bunch of your neighbors, right? Form a community solar project. Yes, which is by the way happening right here in Vermont. In Vermont, it's easy to do. People do it all the time. I don't know how many projects are going up right now. Yeah. But right. there are projects being uh, planned. The solarized movement is 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 underway. The I know there's a local guy named Zyder that's doing it. Nick Zyder is Nick doing Zyder, it. Yeah. Um, uh, Peter Thorell is doing it. He's up in in Putney. Um, okay. And um, but they're not the only ones. No, um, not by by no means. RGS, which is uh, Real Goods. Okay. They're doing it. They have, and you know, you, you call these people and say, what do you got? And they'll tell you, well, we've got places open in a, in a solar array that's going in and, you know, wherever. If and you, the solar array can be anywhere in the state. This is, a, this is a, an accounting thing. Almost it? anywhere in the state. Yeah. If you're in Green Mountain Power Territory, okay. you've got to have it in yep. Green Mountain ter Power Territory. You have to be, have the, 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 the net metered array in the same territory as your utility. Well, that makes, that makes sense. Yeah. So, and Green Mountain Power is very much behind this. They think this is a grand thing because they're, they're buying their, their power from Quebec. They might as well buy it from Vermont. Yes, it costs more power to pay for the, more money to pay for the net metered power from Vermont than it does to pay, pay for the, the hydropower from Quebec. But honestly, I don't think they care all that much because they, they take that power and, and mark it up as a, as a, uh, as a utility, mm -hmm. and if they can get all that power into Vermont, get what they want out of out of you know new business plans and things like that, they're they're, they're happy. They're happy, you know. And if if we as communities can start developing our own local power from solar, from batteries, from wind, from hydro, from whatever from whatever resources, resources we have. we've got, um, we we can keep the profits. We can keep the the maintenance and all of that local. This provides jobs. It pays taxes. It, you know, it's it's like I feel like a 19th century industrial tycoon telling people <laughs> how you know a, a coal plant in their backyard is going to be perfect for them. <laughs> okay. But we're keeping the money within the community. Yeah, if we can keep the and money in the community, thing. and that's a good thing. That's right. Okay, the Guardian had told us this. 
powerful fossil fuel companies and u energy utilities have taken control of key renewable energy lobby groups. Yeah, this is kind of nasty. Oh, man. <laughs> in Europe, in an effort to slow the transition to clean energy, according to industry insiders, they have majorities on the boards of the European Wind Energy Association and the European Photovoltaic Industry Association. Something like that happened here back in the 80s when we first started hearing about photovoltaic. All of a sudden, all the photovoltaic firms were being bought up and owned by people like Exxon. Yes, right. <laughs> and they took them all <clears throat> off the market. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There were a bunch of other things that went on in those days that were yeah, not, this, not this very is business, nice. You know, this is all well, fair and love and business. Yeah, right. All's fair, but the but what happens is that it's the it's the consumer who pays for that, and the consumer in a, in such a choice is not necessarily being given the truth or a choice. You know, I've heard a lot of stuff about what's wrong with wind power. Mm -hmm. And I've checked it out as carefully as I could. Mm -hmm. And the, the amount of what is wrong with min, wind power turns out to be ranging from misunderstanding to, I am certain, outright lies. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and yeah. basically almost all, all, not all of it, but almost all of it is of that type. It's really sad to see that whole groups of people are devoting their, their time and effort to preventing something from happening, which is going to save, which is probably necessary to save species of birds from going extinct. But they're too worried about the wind turbine clobbering some bird from now and again. Well, I think in the long run, money will talk. Already investors are becoming aware that this is a better deal than investing in, say, a coal plant or a nuclear plant. Oh, the yeah. money is moving. The money is shifting. That's right. We're still in the beginning of this. We're, mm -hmm. we're still in a very small part of renewables. It'll be really interesting to see what the average power purchase agreement in 2014 was for wind power. Because in 2013, it was two and a half cents a kilowatt hour. Yeah. And even considering that, okay, they can do that because they're getting 2.3 cents per kilowatt hour in incentives, that still comes to 4.8 cents. And nobody else, natural gas, can't touch that. Can't touch. And for those people who are concerned about, about, um, about uh, incentives uh, and, and uh, government money going to these things, I should point out fossil fuels, mature industry is getting five times as much money. It's as always been subsidized. <clears throat> always right been the subsidized. Beginning. And their subsidies are permanent. Permanent subsidies. They're permanent <laughs> subsidies. And wind power and solar subsidies are not. They yeah. only last yeah. for a certain number of years. So when wind loses its subsidy and they're squawking about that and saying this is a horrible thing, what they're really complaining about, if you want to look at it this way, is the fact that coal is being subsidized big time mm -hmm. and wind gets nothing mm -hmm. it's not it's not fair okay saturday january 24th business news americas mexico will add 66 gigawatt to uh, gigawatts to its wi uh, power grid over the next 15 years with investors investments i'm tripping over my own tongue of 90 billion dollars expected in renewables according to high-ranking mexican e energy official the energy reform will create a competitive market and encourage the use of renewables by awarding clean energy certificates we haven't oh, heard much that. about mexico yeah but it's becoming but it's starting to move isn't it, it? Is. it's becoming the most attractive place in latin america to to uh, invest in in uh, renewable energy after uh, Chile had been out in the lead for quite a while. Yeah, Chile had, had been. We yeah. talked about Chile last week, but Mexico is adding more and more stuff. Interesting picture you had there. It came with the article. Oh, did it? <laughs> I had forgotten it. Yeah, that came. That was from the article. Well, I, I, I assume it. that's a couple of windmills in Mexico. But I, I would don't hope, know but that. you never can tell. It might be in Ontario. Um, okay, next thing from Bharat. Press. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but BH is an interesting combination of letters. It means something entirely different in Irish. Yeah, it's a V. <laughs> <laughs> Only the Irish could figure that out. <laughs> Efforts to combat climate change will figure prominently in talks between Prime Minister Modi and President Obama this weekend. Of course, this has already happened. 
India wants more private sector partnerships and technology to support a drive to expand its use of clean energy from the U.S. The U.S. And we wants have the mm -hmm. private enterprise technology to sell them. That's right. U.S. wants a global climate change deal in 2015. Okay. Well, we've been talking about that. Yeah. Uh, well, I think we're going to touch it again. In we this. will, I'm sure, touch it again. I mean, in this series. Yes. I think we're going yeah. to hit it again. So let's yeah. keep on moving. Okay. Ohio utilities are asking for sweeping bailouts for aging coal and nuclear power plants. I really get a kick out of it every time a nuclear <laughs> power plant says we need a bailout. Because the nuclear industry has been saying we don't get subsidies forever. <laughs> no, Price Anderson is Price a Anderson isn't a subsidy. No, it wouldn't be a subsidy for for anybody out there if I said, I'm gonna pay your auto insurance. <laughs> okay. All right. Please. To the tune of three billion dollars. The Ohioans are asking why they should shell out billions to prop up harmful fossil fuels when they could instead create thousands of good, clean energy jobs protecting their health and prosperity. This from Huffington Post. Well, that's what these guys are doing in that picture there. There you go. You know, why should we bail those guys out? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Especially considering that if we bail them out, they get a lot of money, and if we don't bail them out, we get a lot of jobs. <laughs> Heads okay. I win, tails you lose. <laughs> yeah. Well, unfortunately, that's what the what the utilities are doing to us. Sunday, January twenty fifth, from Clean Technica, we have this thing. More than 800 megawatts of small-scale solar energy capacity was installed in Australia in 2014, according to recent figures released by Green Energy Markets. This 800 megawatts um, of new small-scale capacity was split amongst 185,950 systems. This with, is real grassroots stuff, This is it? grassroots, boy <laughs> is it ever. With the average size of those systems being about 4.4 kilowatts. This is democracy. Yeah, absolutely. This is, Nobody's you know, telling them they can't do it. Power to the people. And <laughs> they're doing it. <laughs> they're doing it. What it says here, considering that the, le the political legislative environment of the last few years in, in Australia, which we've talked about, yep. with regard to considering they're, they're how do they say this? It, well, they're basically, you know, the, the government is against it. Yes. The government's against it, but the people are doing it themselves. Right. What it says here, the tide of public support is continuing to grow. Yeah, well, I mean, in, in this case, it's a person saying, I don't feel like paying this power bill. I'm paying too much and putting solar panels on its roof. And that's what they're doing. And that's exactly, what they're doing. Exactly that. They're saving money. It's it's not necessarily a statement about about global warming or, or anything like that. It's just it's like, I want to save some money. Books. Yeah. yeah, and so they're going to solar and more to of this is money. Well, it's happening big time in Australia. It's happening here, and we don't even notice it. That's right. Yeah. When I'm driving by, and I notice solar panels on a house that I didn't see last week, you know. Yes. Nobody said anything and, and about it. And by the way, for those people who really hate the way solar looks yeah. and are upset because we've got solar all over the place in Vermont, according to the uh, USDOE's Energy Information Administration, there is no solar power in Vermont. Yeah, you told me that. <laughs> We've talked about that. <laughs> Isn't that fun? Uh, they, they, yeah. they don't count anything unless it's five megawatts yep. or bigger. So they don't have anything in Vermont to count because <laughs> everything we've got is five megawatts or smaller. And it, what it does, though, is it gives you a, an extremely skewed um, view of what's going on. And the Energy Information Administration has become notorious for providing bad information. So, next. Yes? Yeah. Moving on. President Obama and the new GOP-controlled Congress face showdowns over climate change, health, and environmental safeguards, but new <coughs> public opinion research shows a strong majority of Americans, including Republicans, in five key states, one of which, by the way, was New Hampshire, support existing protections and tougher environmental enforcement. Is from Investor Ideas. Maine, New Hampshire, Virginia, Florida, and Colorado, according to this article. Okay. Okay. And, you know, it makes me wonder what's going to happen because the, the, the leadership 
of the Republican Party in Congress is saying we're not scientists. Yeah, yeah. And it just it <laughs> bugs me to hear that because they've never been scientists and they've always voted on things that have to do with science. But if they're going to say we're not scientists, then what they should say is, and I suppose that means we shouldn't vote on this issue because we don't know what we're talking well, about. <laughs> really, I mean, the, the it's Defense smoke Department. And mirrors, but, yeah, it's yeah. smoke and mirrors, but it's not doing a very good job of, confu of convincing people. The U.S. <laughs> Pentagon is saying this is the most dangerous threat to U.S. security. And the leadership of the very patriotic Republican Party is saying, I don't know what that's about. <laughs> and it's like the, the Pentagon is, is asking for for things and the Republican Party is saying no. Well, they got to pay back the people that supported their campaigns. So. Yes, the Koch, Koch brothers and and Exxon and um, and Exxon um, Exxon Mobile. Exxon. Yeah. Different guys, but they're in the same ball. Yeah. They're in the same ball. Exxon is doing some stuff in renewables. Okay. Next, National Review <clears throat> tells us the National Review. Sun Zia uh -huh. project, a proposed $2 billion transmission line that would carry renewable electric energy generated by solar and wind resources in New Mexico and Arizona to markets across the West, is a single step closer to being in service following final federal approval. The line is to be 515 miles long. That's a good sized line. It's a good sized line. Yeah, good sized line. $2 billion. $2 billion, absolutely. Yeah. You want a job? It, it, you can go out there. Obviously, it makes sense to somebody because that two billion dollars didn't come out of the earth. It didn't come out of the air either. Yeah. Although you know, it's there. It is okay. Well, it kind of makes sense. The the wind is here. The sun is here. The people are there. Yes. Let's get the power Let's to get the people. It all. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Monday, January twenty sixth. Clean Technica tells us the Indian government is looking to set a target of one hundred gigawatts under its national, national wind energy mission. While the mission, mission is being mulled for almost a year, it could launch within weeks, if not uh, months, if not weeks. The plan is to add 10 gigawatts per year of wind power for seven years, adding to the country's current capacity of 22.5 gigawatts. Well, we've been talking about solar in India, but they're harnessing wind too. Yeah. They're really, they really want to bring the Indian people up to the 22nd century. That's right. 100 gigawatts of wind power is the equivalent ten. of... A, no, this is a hundred, they're setting a target of having 100 Oh, 10 gigawatts. a year ten for a seven year years. For seven years, yep. plus the 22 and a half that's yep. already there. Okay, there's, there's 100 your 100 gigawatts year. of wind power in, in seven years. Uh, that's the equivalent of about 30 good-sized nuclear power plants. Very interesting. Yeah. That's a lot of power. Interesting picture here because it's kind of pretty mountains. This yes. is the northern part of India where it's yeah. where the Himalayas are starting. So I guess you'd call these the foothills of the Himalayas. Yeah. And uh, there's those windmills. Yeah. This is a real picture. This is an artist. This is not an artist's conception. I wonder if the sky is really that blue. <laughs> well, there's wind turbines there. The sky is always blue over wind turbines. That's why. <laughs> That's why I've seen put, some really nice pictures of sunsets and with wind, wind turbines. With wind turbines, like yeah. I believe it. My son told me about driving through, I think it was Arizona or New Mexico, and he told me about how wind turbines were dangerous. And I said, why? And he said, well, I came over this rise, and there was this huge expanse of wind turbines. And I was watching those wind turbines just going around. And, around, and they were so graceful. And <laughs> you then got as, hypnotized. As, huh? I, as I drove, all of a sudden, I realized there was a funny sound. And it was coming out of the car because it was going 90 miles <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, wind turbines are dangerous. Okay. Melee Mail Online, the world's largest oil exporter, has chosen not to cut production, counting instead on lower prices to stimulate consumption. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, consumption's been going down. Consumption is declining, according to former advisor to the Saudi Arabia's uh, petroleum minister. Now, this is coming pretty close to the horse's mouth here. The well, this Saudis, is very close yeah, to the horse's mouth. The Saudis are watching investments in fuel efficiency and renewable energy. You know, we were sitting here saying they're doing it 
because they hate the Iranians or the, be, be, to stop the, yeah, the, the Russians, the Russians yep. or to yep. destroy the American shale yep. oil industry or, you know, and there's this long list of things and maybe they're sitting well, there I, saying, I, well, we I, can I, get I'm that too. I'm a conspiracy too. theorist. Yes. I think they are, you know, but. Uh, I'm, a, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I believe in that conspiracy. <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> this is an interesting picture. It's yeah. a, uh, well, this is the Sheba complex. Oh, I don't even have it up. No, oh. you don't. Here we there go. There you go. And there's a flare, which is interesting, because when I first flew over Saudi Arabia, there was flares everywhere. Yes. Two years later, there wasn't any. Really? They had captured all of that gas. Wow. Wow. No, they, they realized they were wasting money. Of course. You know? Yeah. But this is interesting, because it's in the area that they call the Rubel Kali, the okay. Rubel Kali Desert, which is the most desolate part of Saudi Arabia. It means that's saying a lot. It means empty quarter, and nobody even lives there. Even the Bedouins don't go there. <laughs> you know, it's like 120 degrees. Like well, won't say in the shade because there isn't any shade. But <laughs> in the summertime, 120, 130 degrees down there. Yeah, it gets hot. It gets hot. So this is the southern part of Saudi Arabia approaching Dubai. Okay, it's north of Dubai, south of Saudi, and now they're digging for oil. Okay. Well, in this particular case, I guess it's gas, oil and or gas, but they're flaring it right now, which is wow. also interesting. Okay. Well, this is a, <laughs> the Saudi, Saudi oil minister talking about this. He says, the stone age didn't end because of a lack of stone. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think that's true. And the oil age is not going to end because of a lack of oil. The Saudis are more worried that the world is edging closer to peak demand. Closer to peak demand. That's, that's sort of the opposite of what they said. What what yeah. the beginning of this article said. Well, I think I think what they're saying is that the, is that they're worried about the fact that the demand is going oh, they are. down. Yeah. Okay. Move on. Move on. Foster's Move Daily on. Democrat brought us this: gas and electric prices spiked last winter in New England. By far, this winter is different. In December, wholesale electric and natural gas prices were down 55% and 64% from last year, respectively. January saw some price increases on cold days, but much less than last year. And you know, I'm sitting here thinking, wait a minute. National Grid raised the electric rates in, in, in Massachusetts, in its area, in by 37%. Yeah, yeah. And what's going to happen to all the money they're getting? <laughs> they're they're charging thirty seven percent more for something that has lost fifty percent of its price. Well, last year they got caught unexpected. Yeah, yeah. And they they didn't have enough capacity and people were people were cold. Yeah, there was a lot of people really really didn't have heat. Yeah, so they prepared for it. Yep, and it looks like they may be over prepared over, for it a little bit. Prepared for it, yeah. Which is probably better than under preparing for well, it. Well, it may be, but it 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 leaves me sitting here scratching my head, you know, wondering what is going to come of this. Okay, I think we'd better we'd better we'll continue. move along. Tuesday, January twenty seventh, a new study has found that wave energy pr production, once the infrastructure is in place, would be a reliable, steady, and dependable source of electricity, even cheaper than wind power. Along the U.S. coastline, it could make 1,170 terawatt hours per year. That's enough to supply half the U.S. annual electricity demand. Just from wave power. This is not this is tidal. Part, this is not yeah. windmills. This yeah. is just, just from waves. the undulating of the undulating waves. Undulating of the waves. That from take this part. Picture, we show, we've seen this picture That's, before. That, that fascinates me. Yeah, isn't it? Great it looks big like a, sea snake. Yeah, yeah, it looks like a big snake. A big kind and it's of undulating, power. and as it undulates, it's generating power. I wonder. You know, I think I could get seasick just watching it from a <laughs> beach. <laughs> but what they did say in the article that sort of makes sense: these things being mechanical and we're moving all the time, moving break all down. The time. Yeah, they're subject to a heck of a lot of stress. Yes. And while it, they didn't say it really cost them a lot, they said that investors are leery. Well, it's new technology. Yeah, yeah. And uh, investors are always either leery or very excited about new technology. And the interesting thing is there's so many new ways. They're, they're not even new ways, but newly re rediscovered ways 
of generating electricity. Yes. And it's suddenly, so, suddenly starting to make sense. Yes. And we're just in the beginning of this. Yes, that's right. And, you know, it's like, you think about hydropower, Every, a lot of people think, oh yeah, I know what hydropower is. You build a dam, you have turbines, you, you make power. But you've well, got to build that dam. Well, you have to build the dam if you're going to have one that works at a dam. But I can, I can name five different kinds of hydropower offhand. And that I, don't require that dams. don't require yeah. dams. <laughs> yeah. And that's five different kinds of hydropower. And, and nobody's really talking much about that. A lot of people are really in the dark about it. There could be underwater turbines the entire length of the Connecticut River. Nobody would know they were there. I think that's true, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Renew Economy tells us under, the underlying theme of the agreements in the U.S. Uh, with China and India and the position taken by the leaders of the world's three most influential national economies is that coal no longer rules. The all of the above credo that once dominated their thinking on energy is morphing into, quote, anything but coal, end quote. Yeah. <laughs> There's these two guys again. Yeah, I, I recognize <laughs> them. But India is moving. They're moving fast. They, they know what they're trying to do, and they seem to be well on their way to accomplishing Yeah, they it. are, however, putting in coal-burning power plants, putting in nuclear plants. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I wonder how long that's going to last because the wind and solar and so forth that's going in is so much cheaper. The money will eventually decide. The money will the decide. The economics are going to eventually and go. And the, the coal, you know, the, the India has got w pollution that's even worse for, than China, from what I understand. Well, this article goes into that a little bit. It talks about the U.S., China, and India talking about they're all big polluters. Let's get together decide what we're going to right. do. They've already talked about it. Right. They just haven't right. codified it. And well, it looks like they will right. do something like that. Okay. Click Green tells us the UK government has been forced to perform a U-turn and concede a number of opposition amendments to squeeze through the legislation that will allow shale gas development to go ahead. Yeah, this is kind of a left-handed thing to do, isn't it? Boy, isn't it? Ministers had to accept 13 conditions laid out by Labor watering down fracking laws to pass them through Parliament. Now, Scotland, And this is Labor way, doing it. That doesn't make sense. The labor <laughs> is taking the position that they want, they want to make fracking difficult. Oh, okay. That okay. makes sense. Yeah, and may, I, I read it today, wrong. Scotland today put a moratorium on fra fracking. Yeah, it happened. I, I think it's that's not, in this article. It may be that they were putting it, they were yeah. about to, but they announced Oh, but the, they've announced that they actually did it. They're actually doing it, and they announced that yesterday. And that's going to be a six-year moratorium, I think, and they're going to study everything until they get to the point of knowing that they don't want it, and then they're going to ban it altogether. They, they were using this, the... Um, the uh, example of New York State as, you know, okay. <clears throat> well, this, there's more pressure on some of the other governors, like particularly Pennsylvania, to follow New York's. That's right. That is right. Yeah. And that's, I think, the Marcellus Shale. Uh, sh well, uh, it, that is play. the Marcellus Shale, and it goes into New York, and it goes into Pennsylvania. It's yep. like being into Scranton. And it's, it, it's one of the only productive plays in the United States. It's one of the the first biggies. Yeah, and I, it's still going, but it's it's not lead, it's not living up to its initial promises. Well, there's yeah, there's th there was more about that today too mm -hmm. in the news, and we won't have that here. But it's it's um, things. In case you're wondering what that drew, picture of the door is doing there, that's number ten Downing Street. Well, why where don't the we Prime put Minister that up lives. so people can see oh. what it is instead of my beard? <laughs> Sorry about that. I thought everybody was looking at it. I'm looking uh -huh. at my screen here. Yeah. Number 10 Downing Street. Uh, it says 10 right on there. There it should, does. should have known. So that's, that's sort of the British White House, I think. Yes, it is. Yeah. It's the Prime Minister's residence. Okay. okay, Business Spectator tells us this. Global nuclear power capacity increased slightly in 2014. Five new reactors, totaling 4.76 gigawatts, began supplying electricity, and three were permanently shut down. Nuclear generating capacity increased net 2.4 gigawatts compared to wind power, com which, compare, which uh, uh, increased by 26 gigawatts. Thus, a long-standing pattern of stagnation in the nuclear industry continues, business spectator. 26 gigawatts of wind power is not 
the same as 26 gigawatts of nuclear. It's the same as about nine. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So, but wind power is adding, solar is adding, um, nuclear is, uh, my guess is that worldwide nuclear power is going to start decreasing very soon. Stagnation. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to read read it here. It isn't quite making sense, but what it's basically saying is wind and solar capacity that was built in 2014 right. greatly overshadows the two nuclear plants that were built. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. greatly overshadows Greatly it. overshadows it. There's no question about it. And it, that's, that is wind and solar are still increasing. The, the rate of increase in wind and solar is still increasing. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and and the rate is of increase is, is increasing. increasing, and the rate of increase in nuclear is, is decreasing. Decreasing, yes. So it, you know, it's and I honestly I don't see how we can get back onto nuclear at all. It's too expensive. It's too expensive now. Yes, yeah. it has once too cheap to meter, and now it's just too expensive for yeah for the investor. Yeah, yeah. that's what's going to decide it. Yep, that's right. The world, uh, this is from Greenwise Business, the world can enjoy higher standards of living, more travel, more travel, that's an interesting thing, while drastically cutting emissions to avoid dangerous climate change, but only with sweeping changes to our infrastructure, the natural world, agriculture, and, and in addition to that, the assumption of the continuation of poverty for many. This is according That's to the UK government. That's the downside government. of this. Well, yes. you know, I, this is UK government analysis. And one of the problems with analysis is that it's very often wrong. <laughs> and honestly, I really believe that if we decide that we're going to um, do the best we can with this as a society, as a species, we can have, uh, we can have people who are in poverty living far more comfortably than they are now. Um, but well, no. I'd like to see it happening. I would. I'd like to see it happen. I would. But I think. But, that by the way, a little sidetrack here. Yeah. The author of this article. Did you notice that? No. She's Fiona Harvey. Oh yes, <laughs> I do remember that. Yeah, <laughs> Fiona Harvey. Yep. Fiona Shaw is one of one of my w w favorite actresses. Uh huh. You know who she was? No, I don't. Is Fiona Shaw is the woman who played um, Harry Potter's mother's sister, who that horrible woman in the Harry Potter. I movie. didn't see any of you it. You didn't so see it. No. Okay, but you know, it, I've seen her in a number of things besides Harry Potter films, and she seems to be a very pleasant person in all this, of those. This things. was a very long article. I Which mean, is that? So the, the, the article that's up on, on the standard of living. Yeah. This, it went into all of the different countries that were involved and oh, yeah. talked about what they were going to do, what they were going to have to do. It's, it's an interesting article if someone wants to look into it. Greenwise it's going to take business. you about 17 days to read it. <laughs> <laughs> I did not read that whole article, I will tell you that. Well, I don't blame you for not reading that whole article. I did read a fair amount of it. this picture wasn't in it. So. Yeah. Okay. This, this is supposed to mean the good life. Yes. The, the, the idea of travel, in, in, increasing the... Your, well, yeah, touch base, touch on that. You know, more travel, really? Um, travel is, well, you know what, Tom? People could travel more, as I think about it. The problem is maybe they should be traveling differently. I'll buy that. You know, I'll buy that. when I was a kid and when, when before, when you and I were kids, you know, if you think that back to the, at one time. Yeah. <laughs> if you think back to the 1940s and 1930s and you think about that, how did you want to cross the ocean? You'd take the Queen Elizabeth or the Queen oh, Mary. Yeah. Oh yeah. I used to see the Queens tied up in dock in New York City. Yeah. And wow, what what magnificent. Magnificent. Boats. But the thing that was interesting about that was here today, you go to a you go to a an, an international airport, you go through through a couple of hours of of screening and people yeah. prodding you yeah. and stuff like that. <laughs> and you you get on an airplane and you're scrunched into a seat and a couple of hours later you get out in London. Um, a couple of hours, however many hours it is. Well, in those days they a had cruise, a different... A cruise was pretty nice. If yeah, the weather in, was good, the In those was days nice. it was a very different matter. You'd get on a, on a boat, 
you'd have a nice stateroom, hopefully. Yeah. I mean, unless you were really poor. <laughs> but you'd get on a, on one of these ships, and yeah, you could go swimming on the ship. Yeah. Because yeah. they had swimming pools, you could go dancing. You could. They had nightclubs. They had uh, various things that could entertain you if you were in the in the proper position to do it. You could visit the bridge and see what they were doing and eat with the captain. Eat, eat with the captain. <laughs> and it, interestingly enough, and I've known people who did this, and they said it was a delightful experience. You didn't have to pay a lot of money because you didn't have to go on one of those expensive ships. You could go on a freighter. I've heard of that, and I've heard a, that's a good thing, too. Yeah, it would take a little bit longer, but you always ate with a captain. Yeah. And it was not very expensive. And, and it yeah, was good food. And it was good food. <laughs> the only thing is, it was there was no nightclub. There was no swimming yeah, pool. Yeah. You know, but if you were the kind of person who was going to be quiet and enjoy You can still do that today. Can, yeah, you can do it today. But the point is, traveling was done in a way that was essentially fun. Mm -hmm. And people did not want to take quick transits to the ocean because it was so much was fun, fun to go across yeah. the ocean. It was the vacation. You get to the place there, you'll look around at Windsor Castle, you say, oh, you go back again on your ship and take off. Yeah. I get drunk with the Q, the with the crew of QE2 in Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> oh dear. Oh my gosh. Okay, we have one more item. You might as well just do it. The Vermont's Public Service Department has awarded two Vermont-based companies, Casella Resource Solutions in Rutland and Grow Compost in Waterbury, with Clean Energy Development Fund grants to build and operate pilot projects to demonstrate the feasibility of anaerobic digestion of food scraps. And this is from a, a publication called Renewable Energy from Waste. I understand that, at least in Brattleboro, they're going to start collecting food scraps as part of the recycling. Oh, they already have. They've already started? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and, but, but what happens is, if you've, got the, if you've got the food scraps and you've got the recycling, the food scraps are going to make methane if you've got anaerobic digestion mm -hmm. going on. And this is really a, 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 a wonderful solution. Absolutely. You make methane, the methane is burned, it makes electricity. You may, when you make the methane um, and you capture it and burn it, it means that it's not going into the atmosphere. So even though you are emitting a small amount of carbon dioxide as you do this, it's nowhere near as powerful as a greenhouse gas as methane. As methane. Yep. But in addition to that, the other product that you get, the byproduct of this is compost. Yep. And the compost that comes from good quality food is good quality compost. And in a place like London, where you know, the Prince of Wales has talked the the, the uh, restaurants and hotels into, into using organic food. You've got organic compost. Mm -hmm. So you've got this, this stuff with, that you can sell for a fair amount of money in addition to the in electric power the that you've generated. Or you can use the uh, methane to generate plastics. Yes, absolutely. Fuel, you can do that. All sorts of things. There are things. a lot of things yeah. that you can do with these... With these uh, with these uh, carbon So we're on the edge of a great turning, really. We're watching it happen. Yeah. This is really kind yeah. of exciting. Um, and it's, it's an interesting thing to, you know, watch history develop. Um, and it's very nice to be able to do this and say, yeah, history is happening and I can be a spectator and not have to worry about watching people shooting each other as part of the particular project. <laughs> yeah. You know, we're watching something which is kind of like a war with no casualties. This article is kind of kind to Vermont. It's kind to Vermont. Kind to Vermont. Okay. Yeah. Vermont agriculture has led the nation in many ways. Yes. For instance, we have more on-farm <laughs> manure digesters compared to our number of cows than any other state. We, we have, have, more, we have more than, we have more of these digesters than any other state, period. You don't have to compare it to anything. Yeah. And these two pilot projects are going to help create a model to guide how food scraps can be used as a safe and valuable resource yep. for farmers who operate digesters. Yep. Keeping Vermont farmers at the forefront of renewable energy. Well, they should be. It's another crop for them. That's right. We have to say goodbye. We're 19 seconds left, huh? Yep. <laughs> let's say goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, except let's say goodbye with us on the screen. <laughs> I'm trying to do that. <laughs> uh, there there we go. go. Okay. Goodbye, goodbye folks. <laughs>
We spin and we toil, we work all day, sowing and reaping, we store goods away, so we can be dressed well on the day that we die.